This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. Today's episode, we are talking about the best running session or sessions for a triathlete. But before we get into the episode, a special announcement about our free Trivelo Facebook group. Now, some of you might already be in there, but many of you won't. And so this is our official invitation for you to come and join our community. Dad and I are active in the group and inside we are sharing our best resources and streaming free live coaching sessions to help you with your training and racing. So if you'd like to join this free community on Facebook, you can just type in Trivello Coaching into the groups area in Facebook or go to www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Trivello Coaching. So that's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Trivello Coaching. Plus, we'll put the link in the description of this episode for you to go and join. And we want you to join the group, introduce yourself, and we'd love to hear from you and see more of you in there. But Let's get into today's episode. So our starting segment, as normal, when it's you and I on the podcast, Dad, we want to start with some gratitudes and uh, just remind ourselves, a quick reminder for all the listeners out there that the gratitude section is just an easy way to remind yourself of what you're grateful for in your life and in a world of negativity. It's an easy way just to remind you of something that is positive in your life and uh, definitely helps with mental health. So, Dad, you can start with the gratitude. Uh, Good intro, Jordan. I could start with a negative, which is what I'm grateful for. The negative was I cracked my uh, road bike frame, which happens, and apparently um, I'm pretty rough on bikes. Someone told me the other day, <laughs> so I've cracked a few bikes. Um, and I'm grateful because every negative has a positive, and you just got to find it. And instantaneously, I was uh, able to contact Giant, uh, and it's a definite plug because they've been outstanding um, with. Um, you know, warranty frame straight away, um, no questions. Uh, in the meantime, they've given me uh, a loan bike to to ride whilst I'm waiting for, you know, during the COVID period, you know, there's not a lot of uh, stock around. So I'm so grateful to, to, to be part of the giant family and, uh, and get the service that uh, I, I was, you know, probably – thought might happen, but uh, you never know. And uh, I'm just so grateful for uh, that community of, uh, of Giant. Absolutely. We are not, not afraid to plug Giant on this podcast because they are the official sponsor of Traveller Coaching. So um, very happy with that. And you're pretty happy with the bike as far as I'm aware because you um, had a pretty good hill session yesterday where you were a lot faster <laughs> on this new bike. Yeah, I, was, uh, I did note that maybe my my bike had been cracked for a while because when I put the power down on the pedals, the bike went forward at a much better <laughs> rate. So yeah. um, it might have been a little bit spongy before. I didn't realise that I'd uh, cracked it earlier. So anyway, yeah, it's certainly happy with the replacement. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my gratitude is uh, my gratitude is also almost a negative one spun in a weird way, and that is I'm grateful for social media. Now, I've had um, a bit of a hatred for social media in the last week or so, or maybe the last couple of weeks. Um, and so I decided I was going to turn it around and try and be grateful for it because uh, I actually removed myself off um, the Facebook feed um, a year ago. I'm still in there and I can see our, our traveler groups um, and that's all I use it for. I don't actually see any news feed because I just found it was too negative last year and I just got so sick of it. And um, other social media platforms have become the same sort of thing. You know, it's just full of a lot of negativity at the moment. And uh, for me, I just wanted to turn around and say, I've been spending less time on there because um, it is just full of negativity, but I am grateful for social media and how much it actually adds to our lives and how much readily accessible information is on there, um, how much, um, you know, sport highlights, um, updates of um, social things, updates of um you know, I get so much triathlon and cycling news from Instagram, for example. Um, it's great insight into um, an athlete's life. You know, so many athletes are just showing everything about their training and life, which is so fantastic. So while it can be very negative at s- sometimes, um, I'm also grateful for the positive things it does bring and the opportunities that it does bring, especially for our coaching business. You know, social media is a really big aspect of ours. So I actually wanted to extend some gratitude for it and just say that if it is being too negative, just get off it and get off it for periods. And it actually does wonders for, for your mental state throughout the day. Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good point, Jordan. It's a platform for opinion. That's what it's being used for. And I don't think that's what the original intention was. I think it was a platform to spread spread news about what's happening. As you just mentioned, you know, you got so much information from the welter at the moment, so much information from the 
um, you know, the Paralympics, um, you know, all stuff that you want to read about. Um, not people's opinions. I don't <laughs> care about people's opinions. That's not what it's meant for. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really good point. Yeah, great. Next segment is what has caught your attention. And I'll start. And um, I just want to talk about this concept um, of giving yourself permission to fail. Um, and on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about how good it is to when you are nervous for an event or you've got a race coming up, um, you can get much in your own head by wanting to succeed so badly that you just focus on the result. You are extremely anxious and nervous about the result and it can detract from your performance. But instead of focusing on the process, just controlling the things you can control and focusing on um, executing you know, your performance to the best of your ability um, and giving yourself, I really like this concept of giving yourself permission to fail. You know, If I just do this process as well as I can and I don't hit the time that I want, then that's fine. You know, I've given it my best crack. And from that angle, I just have found that really helpful. Recently, um, a lot of travel athletes, including myself, had a time trial on the weekend and going into it with that mindset of um, just, you know, whatever the result is, it doesn't matter as long as I can say I was proud of the effort afterwards. Um, and if I fail, so be it, as long as I've given it an absolute crack. And that actually takes a lot of pressure off and you end up performing a lot better. Um and on that note, it's also about, you know, give yourself permission to have a crack. And when it's maybe tough in that third quarter part, you know, push yourself maybe further than you you might have been capable of before. Um, and if that means it blows up in your face towards the end of the race, then that's fine. You've executed well to that point. You gave it a crack in the third quarter and again, gave yourself permission to fail. But I just think that's really important and that, that can only work if you do a well-executed plan. You know, if you just go as hard as you can from the start, that's not giving yourself permission to fail because that's just guaranteeing you'll fail, you know? So, um, yeah, for me, that was just uh, something that's really caught my attention. And I think I saw another quote, um, uh, a recent stat that just came out that said, uh, it was remembering Kobe Bryant because it's been just over a year past his death or something like that. And um, it said that Kobe Bryant has missed 14 and a half thousand shots in his NBA career. You know, he scored however many thousand points, 10,000 points or something or more, but he, he missed 14,000 shots. You know, that is a lot of misses in an NBA career. And there's similar stats that we've spoken about before. You know, Babe Ruth has the most home runs uh, in the, in the baseball, but he's also had the most strikeouts and, uh, another one in the cycling world we've spoken about is Peter Sagan um, has won an incredible amount of races and he's also got the record for second places, you know, and it's just um, all these athletes weren't afraid to fail. You know, they just want to keep putting themselves out there and in doing that, they gave themselves the best chance of success. And no, no one remembers those failures. So that was a big point for me. Oh, it's such a great point. And we probably touch on it a fair bit over the journey in our podcast, but it, it's a really good reminder. And, you know, you think about the pro cyclists, for example, you know, putting themselves, putting putting a number on each week, um, you know, they've gone this year, we've obviously we've had some really, you know, events that have been uh, on the calendar and not been cancelled. So we've had the tour, we've had the Giro, and we've had the Welter is, is going at the moment. And these guys are putting themselves up against each other day in, day out. And they're not afraid of that. And, they can't win every ride, every race, only one winner. And I know a lot of everyday athletes won't go into an event because they're not at their best. And and therefore, you're going to miss a lot of events because mm. <laughs> mm. it's very rare that we're at our best um, all year. Um, even once a year, we're probably at our best, or if, if at all, twice a year. That would be when we're at our best. So you're going to avoid every event because you're not at your your best um, f- throughout your whole career. No, you want to use these events as practice, uh, practicing execution, practicing preparation, practicing mindset, practicing uh, things that are going to uh, allow you to get confidence with risk taking, um, trying different. You know, as a triathlete, try and ride different power, try and ride higher, try and ride lower earlier, try try different things in a lot of races that may only only be B races. Um, so what you're saying is so true. And, um, th- th- you know, I remember Roglic, you know, when he lost the Tour de France um, on the last day, we've talked about this before, but, you know, and then he had horrible crashes in other events and didn't win this and didn't win that. He had two years of really disaster and comes out and wins the Olympic time trial. You know, that's a person who's putting himself out there all the time and not getting a result every single time. But boy, when he did get a result, it was, you know, an Olympic gold medal, which will be remembered forever, you know, the time trial uh, at the Olympics. And and here he is leading the, the welter again. Um, and he happened to just crash this today, but he attacked. He attacked and got away from the uh, the main riders today. I'm, I'm getting off topic here, but 
But that's another example of someone just, you know, having a crack all the time mm-hmm. and and yep. uh, and not worried about the result. Mm-hmm. And that's the point you're making. Don't worry about the result. Um, you know, it's the journey we talk about a lot, and and they're they're good examples. So what's caught your attention is kind of in line with today's topic anyway, so they'll kind of blur in together. But uh, essentially, we uh, want to talk about the best type of running sessions uh, for triathletes, and that coincides with the fact that uh, we had a lot of, like I said, travel coaching athletes do time trials over the weekend, and we had an absurd number of running PBs. And so we wanted to touch on what they're doing differently, and that leads into the best type of training for triathletes. So tell me what caught your attention with, with travel PBs. Yeah, it's a really good topic uh, to discuss today. I'm really excited about talking about it. And uh, it really um, was emphasized because we had a period this week where we'd uh, done a really good block of training um, and we got to a point where we were ready to have a recovery week. And and in the recovery week, we want to test ourselves. So we've got a little mini taper happening um, and we do this quite regularly in the program and everybody's a- accustomed to it and adapted to it. And, and they have to go through the preparation of preparing what what power number they're going to ride to and what running pace they're going to run to. And we had three tests, actually. We had uh, FTP, 20-minute uh, uh, time trial on the bike, and we had a 5K run, and we had a, an endurance run as well. And I was staggered at the improvement um, of nearly 100% of the athletes um, across three different days. Um, you know, we've got data from, you know, six weeks ago comparing it to now and the improvement uh, was nearly 100%. And the people who didn't, it was uh, clearly obvious that they had been injured um, or sick um, or they had executed poorly. So they were the three outliers. Um, and there was only a handful of people who fitted in that category out of 70, you know, or so testing. Uh, it was almost like a little mini lab test. Um, that was fantastic. And that's what's caught my attention is um, how did that happen? That's that's what I, you know, I really want to talk about today um, um, and to see the positive uh, outcomes from uh, from our, our preparation and to get that result uh, is what the topic is about today. Yeah. And, you know, those people that executed poorly, that's not so much a reflection of their fitness level. Uh, as we always know, you can be as fit as possible, but if you execute poorly, then <laughs> then your, your, um, your race or your time trial is over. Well, it's funny, George, because you're 100% right there. And, and because we did it as a race, we did an FTP test as a race, the motivation from other people around you can distract you to cause you to execute poorly. And yep. guess what happens on race day? exactly that same scenario so that's why we do it in training yep Yep. spot on but yeah we want to narrow it down to um one of the major things you know we we did we do differently at travello is we have a real strong emphasis on what we believe is the best type of running training you can do as a triathlete and that is hill training and um we do naturally have a strong emphasis on that here but specifically this last block you know we really incorporated um hill training in various degrees um to a wide range of athletes and um yeah we want to chat about that today and why that we believe that is a differing factor a major differing factor in a drastic rate of improvement because um we do see improvement consistently you know through various training blocks and various programs depending where an athlete is in the the program but um yeah we really want to talk about the specifics and the special gains you can make from hill training as a whole yeah, and the topic is really what is going to allow you to get the best out of your running, and and you know it it does relate to the event. Um, and we're not really talking about single-minded runners. We're talking more about triathletes here. Um, so, so why does that matter? Well, it does matter because the requirements of a triathlon running leg are similar to an individual marathon or half marathon or ten k, but they're they're not exactly the same. Um, you want to run at threshold in both events, but you know you can't run at threshold in a triathlon as you can as a marathon runner uh, fresh because you've got to run a different percentage of pace. Mm-hmm. So, so it does it, it it needs to be clarified that we we are really talking about uh, runners in triathlon here. Um, so, but the sessions are still 
the same. We're still going to do similar sessions, but we're not going to do a lot of uh, intense running as triathletes for half ma- half marathon, half Ironman, and for Ironman training because the requirements in that race don't require you to run, you know, six by four hundreds at at sixty seconds because that's not what you can do on race day. Um, that is an important session for runners. That is really important. That might be part of your program, but but I want to make that clear to everybody. You know, we're not saying that the sessions we're advising are the only ones you should do. Um, so, um, so right off the bat, um, the hill running that is undoubtedly the most important session in a in a program um, from start to finish. You must have that in your program, and if you avoid that, um, whether it be because you can't find a hill that's close by. Um, or you avoid them because they're too hard and, and too uh, tiring, then you're missing out on an opportunity to become a better runner than you could ever have dreamed of. On that note, uh, Christian Blumenfeld, the uh, recent gold medal triathlon Olympic champion and recent world champion over the weekend, uh, I was watching a video where he was doing a bit of Q&A and one of the questions was, what advice do you have for a young triathlete to uh, become a better runner and become the best runner possible? And to our absolute delight, uh, he just said straight away, without a doubt, hill running. He said, you've got, to get, you've got to get yourself in the hills and get yourself to a forest, get yourself on some trail runs. And this is what we love because this is very specifically uh, in line with what we say, not just generically hill running. Uh, we say the exact thing that Christian Blomfeld said. And he said, I spend so much time going on trail runs and I'm, I might be running seven or eight minute K pace. doesn't matter. I'm just getting Ks in the legs, running those trails, getting that strength. And that is exactly what we talk about. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard you drill into an athlete and say, I don't want you to run fast at all. I don't care how fast you're running, how slow you're running. Um, sorry, I care how fast you're running if you're running too fast, but I'm not interested in you holding a higher pace. You know, you could average eight minute K pace. The gains will be there. And we have actually seen so many examples of runners doing those endurance sessions, you know, um, not doing any speed work yet just from those sessions, getting 10K PBs, getting half marathon PBs. And to hear Christian Blumenfeld say it um, was just great evidence to me in, in line with this thinking and shows exactly what you're saying. To be the best runner possible, this needs to be a part of your programming. Yeah, and uh, it's always good when you see someone successful and you uh, try and investigate as to why are they so successful all of a sudden, um, and then you trace back to you know what are they actually doing in their program, and and then you hear them uh, being asked you know what have you done differently because all of a sudden when you're an Olympic champion everybody wants to know well what did he do to become the Olympic champion and um, and that's just common that's what happens people want to associate with winners so mm-hmm. they want to they want to replicate. And, and follow the exact, exact same program. And don't forget, this is a professional and we're all everyday cyclists who have jobs and families. So, you know, we can do a version of that. And and it's it was great to see that almost everything he said is what we've been trying to drum into people for almost the last 10 years of, of, uh, of our coaching. And, and I'm forever, you know, looking at people's programs saying, yeah, of course you selected was – you know, it had 60 metres of elevation. It's meant to be an endurance undulating run. You know, oh, but I don't live near a hilly uh, area. Well, drive to where the hilly area is so that you're going to get the best bang for your buck. And and it's no coincidence that people who've been doing the endurance run, which is they've been doing it fine, but all of a sudden they go and do it at a more undulating, venue all of a sudden I understand they're already doing the session you know reasonably well as you know the one the first point is endurance the second point is strength and that's what we're trying to do strength and endurance but if you miss out on 50% of the component which is the strength you're going to you know miss out on 50% improvement so so you know it's obvious when we see people do the program properly which is go and find some hills and do three or four hundred meters of elevation in your running endurance run and without changing any speed or running any faster, they are running faster PBs in 5K, 10K, half marathon and marathon. It is outstanding and it's, and it's that obvious, but it's the answer, the key to the, to the safe. It's there in front of your face, yet people still will want to run on the flat. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I get really frustrated on my endurance run if I'm in a situation where I can't find hills. No matter where I am, uh, if I'm traveling somewhere, if I'm interstate, I will seek out as many hills as possible. And I will honestly go as far and make the run a little bit boring and just go to a hill and just kind of run up and down it a few times to really get my elevation because I just know the benefit. And I feel like I'm really missing out if I'm just running you know, flat for um, my whole endurance run. Um, and it is hard in lockdown, but again, I you know it's worth almost making that sacrifice if you've got a radius around you, just to find the closest hill within five kilometers and just repeat it. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand that you don't want to do that every single endurance run because you might go a little bit insane, but um, the, we're just the point is the value in it is just so massive. And you know why? Why is it that it's so uh, valuable? Um, you know, these are the things that obviously people would be saying. Well, you know, I hear what you're saying, but but why is that happening? Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we use it. Uh, one, one is we want to we want to get uh, a session where you're running at threshold um, around that threshold mark. Uh, we're not if, we're not advocating sprinting up these hills. This is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to run at threshold. Um, and for the general population, it should be around your five k threshold number. Um, it's a very it's a very generic number, but it is. Yeah, that's, yep. yeah. Yep. Yep. and look. That's for the general population. There are elite runners who who won't get the value out of that by running that slow. There'll be uh, beginner runners, and that's too fast. So mm-hmm. that's why it is a very general sentence. Um, but to give to give the listeners an idea of what, yep. what we're trying to achieve, and the point is, your five k pace is not your sprinting pace. It's not a hundred meter sprint. That's the, that's the main clarification. That's right. And and if we did do this on the flat, we would have to run fast to get the same value, um, and that takes a little bit of uh, understanding. So, thinking about that, if I run on the flat, I I can run faster um, than I can uphill, but I can get the same effect uphill by the having a resistance against me, which is absolutely affecting my quads and hamstrings and glutes, um, and getting an aerobic uh, training effect that is undeniable, and you can't get that um, unless you run flat out on the flat. Um, and you don't have to run fast uphill to get that same value. Uh, and the other bonus is you're not going to injure yourself by running at this pace as compared to running flat out on the flat, which, which is what we're trying to do. And of course, as in a triathlon, you know, you're not going to run that fast anyway. Um, so you, you're more specifically running towards the pace that you'll be doing on, on race day. Um, so there's so many good things about the hill, uh, the uphill, and of course, to get to the bottom of your uphill, you have to run down. So you're getting eccentric contraction, you're getting concentric contraction. So the running down is absolutely good for you as well. Um, it just builds strong um, fiber muscles that are, are working both ways. And and these are little things that you know people are asking, why should I run hills? So these are the answers. Mm. Um, and the main thing is that you're going to have less risk of injury um, at, the, at the end of the day. And that is so crucial to getting to the start line. And, and I've said it so many times, you know, it's all great doing all these great, great training sessions, but if you, if you cause yourself to get injured or so fatigued, you know, you don't get to the start line, then it's pointless doing that training. Yeah, and a caveat on that injury thing, um, which we always want to say, is that um, if you run them fast, if you're sprinting up them, you know, power sprints, uh, and it doesn't have to be fat power sprints. The fact is running uphill does put extra load on the muscles. Um, it's why it creates that strength effect. Um, so there is, you know, a lot of physio rhetoric is that it does increase risk of uh, hamstring strain, for example, but that's why we, we back off the pace. You know, we're not doing... 10 second power sprints up a hill like an AFL team would, you know, we're not even doing, um, you know, short 20 second bursts up the hill, um, trying to get max power. Um, you know, they're, they're longer efforts and the, the pace is a little bit slower. And that is to replicate, like you said, kind of five kilometer threshold efforts. And then if we take it back to, you know, the reason we don't do on, on the flat is it's all about management and let's take it back right back to the race goal, you know, getting to the start line is a big achievement for age groupers because uh, injuries are just so common. And so, any advantage we can take to try and reduce the risk of injury. And if that means um, not doing threshold efforts on the flat, because running that speed um, does risk injury for the age group triathlete, um, if we can take an advantage and take it to the hill, um, then we're going to do that from an injury prevention point of view. And then like you are saying, from a strength point of view, that's one of the biggest benefits is that um, the strength you get um, – from running hill repeats and many studies point to this evidence that it improves running economy, which is your ability to run efficiently, you know? So um, 
I guess we, I want to touch on that next, Dad, in, in terms of this running economy. And um, I mean, I, I'm going to say quote unquote strength because in this definition, by strength, we basically mean um, economy, we basically mean efficiency. Um, but there's a psychological and physical benefit to improved strength, improved efficiency, isn't there? Yeah, and I'll probably digress a little bit here. Look, um, the feeling you have, let's just, let's just not talk about science at all. Let's just go by anecdotal evidence that you have when you train in hills and you go and do a race on the flat. You just feel like you've been released. You have no resistance. You are almost free running. And, and that is something that, that I think uh, people don't really experience unless they've, unless they've trained in the hills. And the minute you go onto a fast flat course, it feels incredible. You feel like you're invincible. You can just run fast. Mm. Um, and yet you haven't done any fast running in your mm. training. And, you know, that is one of the key things that is, is, a, is psychologically really an advantage. Um, and everything, every advantage we're looking for in training, whether it be physical or um, mental, it is important. If it's a placebo effect, then great, we'll mm. take it. Um, but it's not a placebo effect. It is, it is, you know, well documented that uh, being strong uh, in the legs from training in the hills will absolutely make you a faster runner on the flat. Yep. Yeah, spot on. And look, uh, we'll be the first to say that uh, there isn't overwhelming evidence to say that, um, you know, scientific evidence to say that hill running is superior to flat intervals. You know, that's just not the case. And that is not what we're saying. You know, we're saying that hill running has its benefits in other ways. Um, obviously, they both, they were both running threshold on the flat, running threshold on the hills will both improve everything that you want it to, you know, improve your VO2 max and improve your running ability. But as we're going through now, there's just so many benefits to the hill training that are added bonuses. And that's kind of what we want to go through. And um, just on that point, George, um, before we move on, the the back half of any event, whether you're running a fresh 5K, 10K, half marathon or marathon, the back end is when you're searching to hold, you know, that third quarter, if you break a, a 10K into two and a half, 5K, seven and a half K, 10 K that five to seven and a half K is the third quarter, the, the premiership quarter. And if you've been doing the strength work, you can hold your pace or possibly negative split by absolutely being strong when it counts. And if you've just been taking the easy option, and it's not the easy option, I shouldn't say that, taking the option of avoiding hills, you will not feel the same uh, invincibility in that third quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you you know yourself from your own uh, training when you've, you know, boy, I, I, I didn't fade in that important section because we can all run fast in the last two and a half K because we're nearly home. But, you know, we're fresh to run the first two and a half K and the second two and a half K we're settling into the race. But the third two and a half K is when, when we – draw on that strength and and in a triathlon that's the second half of the marathon or the half marathon where you can hold the same pace that you're Mm. trying to hold from start to finish whereas you will fade if you don't have that strength and stability that you've been training for for six months and we're not saying that this is every session you should be doing is in a hill that's Mm. not what we're saying either But, but i've got to make that point one of the key things is that that strength when it counts when you're being tested and you want to hold the pace that you've set yourself in the in the uh, race plan, and all of a sudden you start to feel yourself fade. You know, in the back of your mind, bloody hell, I've ridden, I've run that many hills. I am, I can do this, and you start backing yourself, and, and all of a sudden you come through that period, and, and now you're looking at the finish. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I, w- I want to touch on. Um the note of uh, kind of looking at data and looking at uh, real life examples, comparing data to real life examples, exactly what you're, you're talking about here. And if we look at our coaching group, we, we talk about this a lot that we just get these great samples of data um, to look at and great examples of athletes to see, you know, if we implement changes in certain areas, what result does that have? And obviously because it's not um, completely validated formal um, studies taking out all variabilities and other factors, which there are plenty. Um, you know, we just can't say that it's um, scientific proof. You know, if trust, it's just anecdotal proof. But um, rarely, you know, do you see a um, overwhelming amount of scientific proof, you know, saying that this is the exact answer in regards to sports science and, and triathlon or cycling or whatever, you know, this exact session is by far the best possible thing you can do undoubtedly evidence-based you know if that was the case then it would be so um, well known and and so well cited and so black and white um 
But, you know, we look at our coaching group and we look at uh, the amount of PBs that just happened and we've got great data on the fact that um, probably the biggest change made with most other things being relatively equal was um, this block was more focused on hills than normal. And obviously other factors can come in, previous training blocks, you know, athlete training history, that kind of thing. But um, for the fact that these are athletes that we – um, have known for a long time, have athlete, athletes that have improved and been in certain situations previously. And the main variable that was changed was this, and it resulted in a great improvement. We can point to that being a leading factor, you know, not saying that that is the only factor, um, but for us, it's just great anecdotal data to look at. And Jordan, to back that up, it's not the first time this has happened. We have done blocks where we've uh, concentrated on strength and progressively as a bike rider, the FTPs have improved. Uh, progressively as runners, their running pace has improved. And, and it, it, you know, how many times does it has to be a coincidence before we start to go, well, here we go. This is, you know, twice this year we've done this block, um, you know, once early in the year and once now. And both times we had the same results where people improved their FTP uh, on the bike and improved their, their average 5K pace and their, and their half marathon pace. Yeah, um, it, It's just too coincidental for it to be, um, and, you know, whether there's other factors coming into it, the overwhelming majority of the group all did the improvement. So if it was 40% or 50%, we'd say, oh, maybe maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But when mm. it's above 95%, mm. it's, it's unbelievable evidence uh, just from our own little coaching group. Yeah, exactly right. And, look, I had a great conversation with you where um, – we're kind of tr- planning my next training block and um, I'd, I've done a lot of hill work myself, um, probably more than um, more than average. And you said, oh, how are you feeling about the hills? And I said, oh, I'll just keep doing them till, the, till forever because <laughs> because if, if I keep improving, you know, I keep running PBs and I'll, I'll just, I just don't want to change what's working, you know. And you made a good point that it doesn't apply to every part of the year. It doesn't apply to every context of the year and you can't just do – hills all year you know it doesn't doesn't quite work for you know the way you want to get to your race and that kind of thing and that has to be said you know because otherwise like you said before why don't you just do it every session <laughs> and also you can't improve all year you know you're yep. going to have periods where you're uh, uh peaking for an event you're going to have periods where you're recovering post event you're going to have periods where you're building your base um but having that having it in the right order that is that is what's you know the key to it and and you know and obviously there's a different uh improvement rate to a beginner an intermediate and an elite and and look you know to be able to run low 30 minutes for 10k that puts you in a reasonably elite category and for you to improve a minute 30 over 10k uh, just by doing a six-week block of training at, in with strength and conditioning in hills that's outstanding percentage you know overall um, you know, and that's the equivalent of someone going from 60 minutes for, for their 10K to 52 minutes. Um, it's like an eight-minute improvement when you're going from, you know, 35 to 33 and a half. Um, it, it's just incredible. Um, so the rate of improvement might not be in time. It's in percentage. And and they're the things that uh, that you've got the, – the listener has to understand that we're, we're not going to expect that to happen every block. You know, you know, this is coming into the start of the summer, so we're starting to come into some. You know, we've got our base behind us, uh, our strength, and and we're not at, near our peak, but our our improvement is what makes us smile because we've still got more in us, and and the excitement is yes, just give me more of that, um, which is what your you know your reply is. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just do that till you know till till you tell me not to, but we we can't do that. Um, Week in, week out, month in, month out, we've got to we've got to have other periods, and there is a, a limit to it um, where you will uh, need to concentrate on other factors to actually get you to be running faster um, because you've got the strength now, um, you know. And the next phase, you know, just talking particularly about you, um, is to to get you to do some more speed. Um, you've got your base, you've you've got your strength, and now we focus. The season's coming close, and we'll start to do more things like fartlek sessions and things like that that you're going to really um you know go in a new direction but you, you will start to you know feel like you can run faster you know you, we haven't even done any run f- fast running in your program yet so um so it's kind of exciting 
Yeah, and on that point, I mean, speed is all relative because when you say the word speed, you can immediately jump to what you said at the start of the podcast and go, you know, 10 by 400s. But again, um, depending on the your race goal, depending on the event that you're training for, um, yeah, speed is totally relative. And a lot of 70.3 athletes just never have – there's just never any need to do any speed work, you know. Yeah, I should clarify my words really because speed is for a half marathon runner in a triathlon is going to be running some threshold runs, uh, one or two K threshold runs. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's your speed day. Yeah. Um, as compared to, uh, uh, you know, an individual, you know, marathon or half marathon runner where he would definitely be running, he would be doing those sessions as well, the you know threshold sessions, but he would be doing VO two sessions with six by four hundreds and stuff to you know because he's purely a runner. Yeah. Um, whereas we're getting that intensity from our bike. Yeah. Um, so we're talking you know specifically uh, about the relationship between the session and the event. Yeah, spot on. Um, and look, one of the last things I wanted to touch on, and this is very, this is on the same topic of uh, event specificity, is uh, we have a little bit of a tripe with, you know, um, strength strength training in the gym, um, and some recent obsession with that because it is well documented that strength con- strength and conditioning program, um, some weights in the gym can help um, endurance athletes. It, it was always proven to help, you know, shorter event athletes, but it can help endurance athletes as well. That's very well known. Um, but some athletes say, oh, do I need to be doing more you know, strength training in the gym as compared to getting my strength from, from hill running, that kind of thing. And we are very heavily leaning one way for very specific reasons. And this isn't to say that we are against strength and conditioning and gym training at all, but you know, uh, the clear example we want to to talk about is that some athletes feel the necessity to, you know, go and do three, uh, three rep squat max in the gym or five rep squat max to help improve their power. And, um, that will improve your power to a degree. But if you're a 70.3 triathlete, um, there's just no need for you to be doing um, that kind of lack of specific uh, strength and conditioning work. And um, doing something like heel training is going to get you much more specific uh, strength work to what you need. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a really interesting discussion. And um, I'm having that discussion week in, week out, uh, year in, year out. And, and, Let's get this straight. We are advocates of strength and conditioning. We think it should be in your program. So that's mm-hmm. the first sentence. So we're not saying we shouldn't have it. So but the strength it, and conditioning coaches listening can um, <laughs> can yeah. take take a breath and know that that's. <laughs> so so what we're saying is it needs to be more specific to your event. Um, and so if you're going to do on the velodrome the one kilo uh, time trial, I reckon you should be doing three <laughs> three reps. Um, at you know 400, 400 pound um, <laughs> f- efforts, and, yeah. and that is specific to what your requirements are to do. You know, a one minute flat out time trial on the velodrome. Yeah. Guys, you, that are, guys, they're trying to push two thousand watts. Yeah, yeah. you just need to have the most power you can possibly do, and and going into the gym will give you that. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm not coaching uh, any one one kilometer uh, time trialists. Um, most of the people we're talking to are the endurance athletes uh, and obviously the cyclists um, who have a variety of events, you know, time trials could be a 20 K time trial. um, Criteriums could be 30 minutes to an hour. Road races could be, you know, 60 K to 150 K. So um, there's very few events that are shorter than that Um, for running. You know, we have got athletes like yourself doing 800s um, or 5K runners or 10K runners and all that to marathon. For triathlons, we've got sprint, Olympic, you know, 70.3 and Ironman. So so even in all those uh, examples I've given, there is still no need to do three reps squats <laughs> at, at 400 pounds. So, so what's it's an extreme you, example, but we're trying yes. to make a point, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what, what strength and conditioning are we saying is good? Well, we're saying that, Yes, as a part of your program, add the strength and conditioning as long as you're fulfilling the rest of your specific triathlon program. If you're going to cut out something to put in strength and conditioning, I'm not for that. Mm -hmm. I want it to be added. And Mm -hmm. if it's causing you too much fatigue, then I want to wait till your body can adjust and adapt to the program that it's had for two or three months. And people who've just joined our program have heard me say that many times. Oh, when can I do the strength and conditioning? I'm saying, yes, let's, let's just let your body adapt to 
to swim, bike, and run. And then once you've got your your routine and your structure, and you can cope with it, and your fatigue isn't too too high, you're not getting sick or injured. Then we introduce the strength and conditioning, and lots of other things. But it should be part of your program, and we do. Uh, we are very specific in some of the sessions we give you, which have a, an aspect of strength and conditioning. We do do hill repeats as a runner, and that is very specific, as you said. We do do hill repeats on the bike, and, and that is, you know, you can't get any more specific than doing it in the actual action <laughs> yeah. that you're doing. Um, but we also, and I'm a, you know, I'm a believer that one of the things that has kept me injury free is the strength and conditioning that I've been doing over, you know period of 20 or 30 years off and on and i should do it more on than off um and i'm the same i'm you know know, dropping it and then all of a sudden i'm feeling some twinges and and it's because i haven't been you know continuous with my strength and conditioning and i i absolutely think i should be doing more of it um but if it means that i'm going to be too tired i'm going to drop that first um, and try and make time for it uh when i've recovered a bit um so so they're kind of the, the the way that i look at um, the strength and conditioning and the way that I've sort of implemented into your um, way of training. And, you know, you are really good with the strength and conditioning program that we have in our, in our membership site. And, and it's fantastic that, you know, you've been doing this for years and it's one of the reasons why you're relatively injury free. Um, and so for people to say that we're anti that, it's absolutely incorrect. Yeah. And uh, I guess as a summary, firstly, uh, we don't see anything as inherently good or bad. It's all very context dependent, you know, and even in your example just then, um, to make it clear, you know, strength and conditioning has two main benefits. It's it's injury prevention um, as well as performance benefit. And uh, when you're talking about you're getting sort of um, maybe some some twinges or that kind of thing, it's actually the, the strength and conditioning almost ramps up from that injury prevention point of view, but that's a different type of training to maybe some of the strength and conditioning you might do for purely performance benefit. There's big overlap, but um, just to summarize and, and sort of clarify that. And I guess I go back to something that um, our strength and conditioning expert at Trivello Coaching, Dr. Jordan Moncrief, who's been on the podcast, one of my favorite things that he says um, is he says, I don't know why I keep seeing people who can't perform one body weight squat optimally, you know, putting 60 kilos on the back or 80 kilos on the back and trying to get their strength from that. Um, you know, so he's sort of got a similar rhetoric. There's nothing wrong with strength and conditioning. There's nothing wrong with, you know, a weights program, but um, a lot of athletes are just training inefficiencies. They're just training poor technique with added weight, you know, and so you've got to almost take it back a little bit and, you know, get your efficiency right, and which will improve your overall, you know, economy of your body, will imp- improve your overall efficiency and movement um, before adding in uh, things that may actually be um, detrimental with incorrect technique, for example. Yeah, and look, I'm I haven't lifted a weight for that long. I mean, I might do a chin up and a push up, um, and I should be doing some as I get older. I should be actually doing some sort of uh, uh, weight training to to keep my uh, you know my bones and structure um, healthy, and that's something that I really need to work on. And I'm I'm happily admitting that, um, but I'm struggling to do the strength and conditioning exercises with no weights on mm. on me. Um, I've got the shakes, you know, holding the positions that. Uh, that uh, Jordan Moncrief got me in um, without adding any weight. And and I just don't need that for the purpose of the exercises I'm doing for bike riding and for running and for swimming. Um, whereas for uh, muscle development, I definitely would be advocating older athletes to be lifting some weights. And to clarify, you're not weak in those events because you because you're weak, you know, in those movements, um, you've actually got quite a strong core, you know, I would say. And, um, but it's just some of these movements are quite difficult and it is quite difficult to move your body, you know, hyper efficiently. And so we need to really make sure we're training that properly. Um, and struggling with body weight ex- exercises does not indicate weakness at all. Um, it's, it's to do with a whole, um, whole other rabbit hole of a topic about um, efficient movement. And I think it's worth getting Dr. Jordan Moncrief yep. back on the podcast to kind of yep. dive into this because it's a topic that we could talk about for ages. But. Yep. yep. So, look, in summary, definitely, uh, you know, we're all for it, uh, but it needs to be specifically related to, to your event. And that, that is what people need to hear. Yeah. So that's a good way to finish off this episode. You know, it's a topic that we're really obviously passionate about. We really just love a part of it in our program. And we see, when we see the results that we do with our athletes, we want other people like you, the listener, to know how beneficial it could be for you and, and how to get more out of yourself. So that's 
really the benefit of this topic, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, look, you know, I'm I'm hoping that we have some people who change their ways with uh, with their endurance running and uh, with some of their um, their training for improvement in running just by hearing what we're what we're advocating and um, you know. It, it was, it's work to treat for, for our athletes and uh, we want to share that experience with uh, the listeners out there. And, and I know there's a lot of people who are listening intently to some of the advice we're giving. And, and you know, this is one of those gold nuggets that, uh, that you know, is a no-brainer, but it, it has strings attached to it. That's, that's my, my only concern when we're giving uh, and advocating advice. Absolutely. Um, so that's it for this episode. To finish off again, if you want to join our free Facebook community, you can just search us Traveller Coaching on Facebook. There's our Facebook page, which is separate, but there's actually a group Traveller Coaching and you can find that by typing in facebook.com slash groups slash Traveller Coaching or click the link in the bio and you can chat to us in there. As I said, we'll be active in there. We want to hear from you, any questions you have. Um, obviously one of the main things that uh, we're doing in the group is free live coaching sessions live streamed in there, which we want you to be a part of and get a benefit out of. So go join us in the group and we hope to see you in there. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.